Lord, uh, we're just so thankful for everything that you're doing in this church, Lord. We thank you for uh, allowing us to celebrate the Feast of the Transfiguration, um, allowing us to consecrate the Cornerstone on Thursday, celebrating on Friday, Lord, and bring this back into your house today. I ask, Lord, that you just be with us while we uh, are passing through this time in our church, Lord, and that this is the foundational time, Lord, and I ask that you just build that fa foundation very strong, not so much the foundation of the church, Lord, but the families that are the foundation here, Lord. So I ask that you just pour out a blessing on everyone who's here, Lord, and that you may build on top of us, that we may support the Lord of this church. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins. I ask you to bless me, that you give me a word for your people today, Lord, and that you hear these prayers, lift in the session of our saints and our tears, that we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And through Christ Jesus, our Lord, for the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so, um, legal disclaimer, we are having some audiovisual uh, difficulties, so if you can't hear me, I'm sorry. And if you hear a lot of feedback very soon while Claudio is playing with the chords, I'm sorry, but um, hopefully, you know, it'll all go. So, um, I know we were talking about rolling out like our next series for the adult meeting, and I told you I didn't know what it was, and I'm telling you I still don't know what it is. So, um, because I feel like we're wrapping up St. Mary's fast, and we'll figure out... <laughs> I'm on my toes, don't worry. Um, and we'll kind of figure out what that is, but ironically, I was talking to some friends over this week and they're expecting children. And um, the, the idea of, of baby names was always getting thrown around whenever anybody's kind of expecting, right? So we started talking about this name and that name and if a name's important and if a name has meaning. And it reminded me, so of all four of my kids, I only got to choose one, okay? My wife got three, I got one. So I know what you guys might be thinking, that that's unfair. I agree with you. Um, but if you know my four kids and you know me, what's the name that I chose? You should know this. Shame on you. No, I wasn't Nathaniel. I wanted Nathan. She got Nathaniel, so I conceded that one. I don't count that as one of my, one of my names. Okay? Well, it's Elijah. Okay? And I love the name Elijah. And I think it's such a powerful name. And I remember we were like the first ones to like name Elijah, but then I think, I feel like it got really popular afterwards and there's like a lot of Elijahs now. And when I started thinking about, okay, well, what was it about the name Elijah? What did I love about the name Elijah? And a lot of people will think of the fact that you know, he was a great prophet. He did some amazing things, um, miracles upon miracles upon miracles. He was bold, he was courageous, all of this other stuff. Um, but what I loved about the name Elijah was as great as he was, and in all of the strength and the might and the power that God poured through him, he still had a very human side, and he was filled with fear. And I was thinking about that, thinking about this like this week, and the fact that if I had to think about one thing that our world is just so full of right now, it's fear, right? Especially coming out of the pandemic, coming out of everything else that we were going through. We were having, you know, just huge death counts and like, you know, all of this other stuff. And, and, I, and I feel like, you know, even though, you know, COVID's partially over, might be over, spiking, not spiking, you know, um, I don't know if we're ever going to shake that fear that we all kind of picked up along the way. And I think fear, fear is something that's very, like, it's mentioned throughout the Bible. I think we can learn a lot of it, you know, by applying some of these biblical principles to our lives. But the sad part of it is, it's, it's such a strong emotion that a lot of the times we can't reconcile it. Like, we know what the Bible says, but it just, you know, applying it in our life, like, that's, that's the, like, the really, really um, hard part, right? And, and it, it's funny because there's, there's a lot of things that we're all scared of. Um, you know, even, even myself, I hate, you know, I hate snakes, I hate spiders, you know, I hate all of that, like, freaks me out, right? Um, and, and the struggle's really, really real when it comes to those fears. Um, but when you start thinking about the things that we're scared of, it's not so much that you were scared of something, but it's this aspect of control that we feel that we don't have. So if I come across, you know, when I come across a spider, okay, and I, I feel like I've come great leaps and bounds. So I'm, I'm much better with spiders now. It all happened when I got married and I realized that I was the guy who was in charge of killing the spiders now, right? So I had to like step into that role, I had to grow into that, right? But if you think about like the fear of a spider, it's, it's really kind of like totally irrational because how big am I and how big is a spider? 
right? And the whole fear is the fact that I have no control over how this spider is going to react to me coming at it, right? Like it can bite me, it could be poisonous, it could be this. And no, same thing with snakes, right? When you look at snakes, who would you think has the upper hand? You would think, well, for sure, we have the upper hand to the snake. But what is it, where does the fear come from? It comes from this aspect of we have no control of how the snake is going to act and how it's going to act towards us, right? But we should not have confidence like in our size or our dominion, but we should have confidence in the one who has control over everything. And when you put fear in context to who is in control, that should be a game changer for us. It should, it should change everything because God has control over the smallest details of our life. He has control over the big, but even the smallest details of our life, the, th the ones that we've never even thought of. And if we go to the pages of scripture, that's very real. Matthew 10, 29, 31, and it says, are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground a part of your father's will. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore you are more valuable than the sparrows. So that's a beautiful promise that's found in the Bible that says that when we are scared, we should not be scared because of the fact that we know that God is in control. And there's a great story, um, there's a there's a great portion of Elijah's life that just highlights this, right? Because like I kind of already alluded to, Elijah was the man. When you look at like the prophets, just the man, right? If you just rattled off some of his accomplishments, okay? You know, nation, nation of Israel, you know, King Ahab, very, very wicked man, shows up, proclaims a drought, okay? Not only proclaims a drought, but he says there's going to be a drought and it's not going to rain until... I say it's going to rain, right? Then he goes, he's eating, you know, he's drinking from the brook. You know, a raven's bringing him food every single day, miraculous, miraculously. You know, then he departs there and he goes to a widow's house. He gives her endless food supply as well, um, blesses her abundantly in her need. She had another need. Her, her son fell sick, died. He healed him, right? Um, then he, he goes back to King Ahab, who was this wicked king. And he basically tells them, we're going to have a showdown on the mountain, right? We're get, we can, your God against my God, because that was the God of Baal, right? They set up these altars, and he says, whoever's going to call down fire, his God is the true God. You know, obviously, the, the false prophets of Baal could not do anything. They could not execute. But lo and behold, Elijah calls down fire, and it cons uh, consumes the sacrifice. Straight from heaven, fire down, and consumes the sacrifice. After that... He takes the 450 false prophets of Baal and kills them all by the sword, right? So, you know, you, you know, and as if that wasn't enough, right? So he goes ahead and he finishes all of that. And then what does he do? He prays for rain and rain comes. So I'm going to tell you, if you were in the position of Elijah right now, how would you be feeling? Got to be feeling pretty good, right? Just brought the whole nation of uh, Israel to repentance, right? Because they all saw the fire. Right? You just killed 450 false prophets. You just cured a, a drought that's been going for, on for like three and a half years. Right? Like that's amazing. Right? Um, but we look at something like that and you're like, clearly God showed up so big in the life of Elijah. Like that, it's, it's like undeniable works, right? Where God's presence was with him. And I know that none of us have probably called fire down from heaven I pray that none of us has killed 450 false prophets. You know, we've probably never, you know, proclaimed a drought or brought rain, you know, to end a drought. But I'm going to ask you, has God done something for you? Has God done something through you? Have there been times in your life where God's work has been so clear that you can't even deny it, right? Because I guarantee you, for every single one of us, God has brought us through something. And I guarantee you, every single one of us will say that God's hand has been great in my life in one way or another. So my question is, is can you identify something that's been so big in your life that it, was, it had to be God's hand? There's a, it, it couldn't have been anything else, right? Because we have to remember the fact that God's real. He's real in our life. We've seen it. There's been some things in our life that's been so big that we can't deny it. There's this great quote, and it's like, I, gotta stop, I have to stop questioning the things that I don't understand and start holding on to the things that I cannot deny. Because there's things that's happened in our, we just, we can't deny it, 
Like God is real. His presence is real, right? You know, I remember one day I was at work and we had like the, the bank president down and he was in my office and he saw a picture of Christine in my office and he said, you know what, man, you must have caught her on a bad day. I said, I did. I did catch her on a bad day. It was a bad day for her. It was a great day for me, you know, but our spouses, gifts from God. Right? I'm going to tell you something. You did not land your spouse on your own. Okay? You would have screwed it up. Right? It was a gift from God. I also consider myself to have the cutest kids in the world. Right? By the grace of God, they almost all look like Tina. And then the one that looks like me, she'll tell you that it took her genes to straighten out my genes to have a good looking kid. Okay? So there's all these aspects right, where we have to say that we've seen the fingerprints of God like, throughout our whole entire life. And it's so strong that we can't deny it. And you know what? Even after Elijah saw the, the fingerprints of God, after he saw the miracles that God had done, and they were undeniable miracles, right? You would think that this man is not scared of anything. Like whatever God was going to ask him, he would just step up and execute on it. But ironically, in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 3, it says, And Ahab told Jezebel all the things that Elijah had done. Also, that he had executed all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as one of those um, by tomorrow at this time. And when he saw that, he rose and he ran for his life. Does that make any sense? Like that is the exact polar opposite of what we would expect to hear from Elijah after everything that he had seen, right? He ran for his what? Like he ran for his life? You know, Elijah just that day experienced two huge miracles, right? He accomplished great, huge spiritual victories, right? He defeated the prophets of Baal. He brought down fire. You know, you start, I'm telling you, man, like we ran through the resume. It was, it was impressive. And then after seeing all of the ways that God showed up, and this wasn't a one-time show up, right? What you see in Elijah's life is you see a track record of God showing up again and again and again. And then at a point of hardship, he doubts him? He questions him? He thinks he's going to show up again? Right? And we look at that, and I'll be honest, I judge Elijah for that. And I'll be like, how? How? After everything that you've seen for the last three and a half years, your life has been a miracle. For the last three and a half years, you've been living in blessings and miracles. And now you're coming... To doubt? And then I thought we would be ignorant if we were to think that we were any different. You know, because there are times, you know, when are the times that we're most defeated? When are the times when we're most in despair, right? And I will tell you, you know, maybe growing up at St. John and we used to always do the, the winter retreats and we loved it. It was like the high point of the entire year, right? But there was one particular case in particular. And I was talking to a youth, and this youth had been, he'd been far from church, and he wasn't even coming, but he came to this retreat, right? And it was so clear in the interactions and the stuff that was kind of going back that God was like calling him back, right? And he was pouring out grace on him, pouring out promises on him, doing all of this stuff, a number of things that was just so clear that we knew, like I just knew that God was pursuing this kid, right? And, and at that retreat, he decided that things needed to change. That there's aspects of his life he offered a repentance for, and that, you know, he just needed to come back to his first love. He needed to come back to church, right? And he was so on fire by the time that he left, right? And I remember a week, week came by, right? Sunday, no youth, right? The week after, nothing. Call him, text him, I'm not getting responses, right? But when, when I finally was able to catch up to him, right, he forgot about the mountaintop. He forgot about the promises. He forgot what God had told him and what had shown him, you know, and, and it was just easier to give in. It was e easier to give in to the temptation. It was easier to go back to the way of life that he was previously having. It was easier to go back to the old friends, the old relationships, the old patterns, the old sins. It was just easier, right? And I'll be honest with you, and, and that's a very, very clear description just because, you know, it was at a retreat. But personally, what I've realized in my own life is it's not just after retreats, right? Whenever there's a strong time of the presence of God in your life, whenever God does something for you and he is so, so clear, right? And when we should have a renewed devotion to God and a renewed sense of commitment to him, Satan comes from the other side and he comes to attack. 
And just because that we just experienced something great, it doesn't not, I'm telling you, I feel like that is the weakest time that we could be in our spiritual life. Um, and in verse four, he says, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. So that's Elijah's response. Like he's like, I can't do it anymore. Just take my life. It would be easier for me to die, right? And many of us, I will be honest with you, many of us would rather die. And I'm not talking about like a physical death, but I'm telling you, a lot of us in our lives, we'd rather spiritually die than to fight anymore. Like the fight is too hard, the temptation is too strong, you know, you, you know dying to myself, you know, putting, you know, not honoring the flesh, like, you know, and like giving into it. A lot of us were like, it's just easier to spiritually die. Like, I don't want to do it anymore. I don't want to fight anymore, right? And a lot of the times, I, I know that we should not have fear, you know, over the things that God has planned for us. Because God has a way for every one of us to walk into. And the best part of that path is he's at the end of it. And I don't even want to say he's at the end of it. He's along every step of that path, right? But it's a hard path. It's not easy, right? And a lot of us are like, I, I, just, I just don't want to sign up for that. Just let, me, just let me spiritually die, right? Because there's a lot of times where God wants us to fight. And God wants us to move. And he wants us to, to not give in. But it's just sometimes for us, it just looks too hard. Right? And it could be that at many times we just face spiritual fatigue, times of weakness, times where we just feel tired. Right? And I think that God looks down on us and he sees us in those times. He knows when we want to give up. He knows when we're tired. He knows when you just say, God, I can't do this anymore. Like I can't even put one foot in front of the other foot. Like I just can't. Right? And I, I promise you, he looked down at Elijah and that's exactly what he saw. Because Elijah had a long day. It was a day of victory, but nevertheless, it was it was a long day with a lot of fighting, fighting the false prophets, fighting you know, the nation of Israel's backsliding state, right? fighting Ahab. It was still a long day, victory or not, he was tired. right? But what I love about God is God looked and he saw him there, but he did not leave him there. Because it says that you know, he laid down and he slept under a brook tree. And suddenly an angel touched him and he said to him, arise and eat. And then he looked and he saw there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back to him a second time. And he touched him and said, arise and eat because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and he ate and drank. And he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights as far as to Torah, the mountain of God. What did God provide him through this angel? So he saw, he saw his servant Elijah. He saw that Elijah was tired, he was worn out, and he was fatigued, right? And he didn't just leave him there, right? But basically, he supplied everything that he needed for that journey. He didn't wait for Elijah to do it on his own. He met him exactly where he was at, right? He gave him enough to survive physically, and he gave him enough to make it all the way to the mountain of God. And I'm just going to put this, this is just for me, and he gave him cake, which is a beautiful thing because I love a God who will respect the sweet tooth, okay? So he will always meet our needs. If you ever feel in need and you ever feel like, God, I can't do this anymore the way I am right now, what is the difference between our state and Elijah's state? But we have a God who will show up. He will give you what you need, okay? Our needs will always be met. The problem is, is do you know why most of our needs are not met? is because we're looking for them in all the wrong places. We have these needs, right? But we're trying to fulfill it in the wrong way. One of the most convicting verses is Mark 8, um, Mark 8, 36 and 37 says, what, for what will it profit a man if he gains a whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in, in exchange of his soul? And I feel like a lot of the times we have these needs but we're going to God, not like their spiritual needs, but we actually try to make them worldly needs. You know, like, God, I need a little bit more of this. You know, I need a little bit, maybe just a little bit better of a position at work, or maybe just a little bit more money, or maybe just a little bit bigger of a house, or maybe a little bit this, a little bit that. And God is basically saying that, look, I'm in the business of meeting needs, but those aren't my needs to meet. In Elijah here, he said, I'm going to give you everything that you need so you can enter into a deeper relationship with me because that's where you're going to find wholeness. 
right? So when God met Elijah's need, he did it in a supernatural manner because his food lasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the important part to remember about that, because we hear that and we're like, wow, that is amazing, right? But Elijah, those 40 days and 40 nights, he wasn't just hanging out. He wasn't waiting for God to come to him. You know, he wasn't just enjoying the cake and the water, right? But if you really understand what that means, it means that Elijah took what God gave him, gave, took that nutrients, and he basically hiked for over a month to pursue God, to go to exactly where he can meet him. And, that, and, and God gives us miraculous things that we may move towards him. That's his goal. You want to know how God shows up? He shows up to get us towards him not towards some of these other earthly goals that we ha might have in mind, right? And then to go towards him, he needed to work towards that. It was not easy by any means. The journey wasn't easy. It wasn't short. And many times, ours won't be either. So a lot of times we'll say, hey, I'm all in for a week, maybe for 10 days, for two weeks, maybe if we're really long-winded this time, we're going to go three weeks on our best behavior. But the reality of it is, is a lot of the times it's way longer than that but God will feed us in that period. God will give us the nourishment in that period to get us there, right? The same way that God met Elijah's need, he's willing to meet every single one of our needs, physically, socially, you know? A lot of the times I start thinking about all of these things that we need in our life, right? So God wants you to have good, godly friendships, good fellowship, right? That's one of the best things about this church here is that we all get together, we're like-minded, we, we, we love the Lord, we love serving, you know, it, it warmed my heart on Thursday when we went to that groundbreaking ceremony. And then I saw, actually, to be completely transparent, I came to Vespers first, and Vespers was kind of a little bit empty. You know, and I was kind of like, man, there's not a lot of people here. I really hope, like, when we get to the church ground, like, that could be very, like, demotivating, right? We get to the church, and then, like, it's all empty when we get to the groundbreaking. But we go over there, and I was floored, right? That place was packed. More people than would even fit in the tent, right? And I love the fact that that's how our church shows up. Right? And that's how we support each other. Right? God wants you to have a God-fearing spouse. God wants you to take his, his, uh, his image. God wants the best for you. You, know, you imagine what you want for your children. Is there any limit to the, to the good things that you would give your children? Of course not. But a lot of times we think that God is very limited with us. But I'm telling you, God is willing to pour out blessings for you. But it's the good things for you. His definition of good things, not your definition of good things. His definition of good things. And I love it because after 40 days and 40 nights of him basically hiking to get to him, God asks him the most beautiful question. And he says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Can you imagine that? 40 days, 40 nights of hiking. God gives him the cake. He gives him the water. You know, God's fingerprints are all over this. And he gets there and he basically just asks him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And... And here is, he's at the mountain of God, right? And do you think that he meant, what are you doing here physically? Of course not. You know, what was he really asking? He says, where are you emotionally? Where are you spiritually? You know, why has your fear overcome you? And why has it brought you here? Right? Like, like why are you here, Elijah? And I, and, and I wonder if we all flipped that question on us. And we said, why are we here today? Like, why are we here? What is God asking of us today? What is it something, what's something that we, like maybe there's a disappointment in your life right now. Maybe there's something that you feel like God didn't show up for you right now, right? Or something that you're really praying really hard about, but you don't know if this thing's gonna be resolved or not right now, right? And God, and God wants to pull that out of us because he wants to enter into a discussion with us about that. You know, there was no question that he was asking Elijah here that he already didn't know the answer to. But he was pulling Elijah into a conversation. And I wonder if he's asking us today, what are you doing here? Right? He knew that something was truly bothering Elijah, but it wasn't enough for God just to solve his problem. He wanted him to talk about it. He wanted to converse the same way that two friends would. Right? Because God only knows how often we complain. Right? complain about a lot. We feel, we feel a bunch of things about a bunch of other things, right? Our hearts are broken about it, right? And what do we do? We take all of that stuff. 
We might talk to it about all of our friends. We'll keep it to ourselves. We'll do all this other stuff. But we ignore God's question where he says, what are you doing here? Because God wants us to bring that all out. And I love Elijah because Elijah is very honest with him. And he answers, he says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, God of hosts. For the children of Israel has forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets by the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. So when I take everything that he just complained about, it basically dials into two things. So he basically goes to God. He says, you know what, God? I'm alone. Because he felt alone. And I'll be honest with you, it's, it's hard for him. To, I, I, I totally relate to that because he was at a time where the whole nation was wicked. Right? Like to get away from the wickedness, the guy went and he lived in a brook. He just said, I'm alone. I don't have any fellowship. I feel like I'm doing this all by myself. There's no one to support me. And I think that if we were honest with ourselves, sometimes our spiritual walk feels that way too. Where we say, I'm trying, but I feel like I'm all alone. And I'm going to tell you, that's why it's a huge plug. And yeah, it's a shameless plug. But I urge everybody to get into some sort of service in the church. I know we got the women's group on Tuesdays. We've got the men's group on Thursdays. And if you don't fit into either one of those two groups, we can talk about that later. <laughs> we got the women's group on Tuesday. The men's group's on Thursday. Um, because God doesn't want any of us to feel alone at all. And the second thing he complains about, he says, I'm scared. I'm scared. Right? He's killed your prophets all by the sword. I'm, a, I'm alone and they want to take my life too. Right? Wow. How can this man be scared? After everything he does, why? How can this man be scared, right? But then I, you read that and then you have to sympathize. You said, I thought it was just me. I thought it was just me. Because there are times in my life where I felt so alone. Right? There's times in my life where I was in a situation and, and, and I was scared. And I said, I don't know how this is going to play out. Right? You know, and the, the scary part of it is, is we are in a time where we're supposed to be more connected than any other time in the world. Right? You log on to people's Instagram, they've got thousands of followers. You go onto their Facebook, they've got thousands of friends, but everyone's alone. You know, you're talking about people in big families, right? Like I got a wife, kids, you know, more kids than probably any of you guys. And there's still days where I feel alone and, and, it, and it's crazy. But a part of it is just like, you know, God has control of everything. And that's what we have to remember, right? And for us to kick, to kick this feeling of aloneness, we have to get plugged in. To kick the feeling of being scared, we have to give up control, right? Because when we give up control, that is realizing that the only person who is in control is God. And he's the one who, and he's got it. Giving up control is hard. You know, realizing only one person is in control is even harder. But I will tell you, Psalm 37, 5, it says, Commit your ways to the Lord and trust that he shall bring it to pass. Psalm 37, 5, that's a memory verse. Everyone should remember it, right? Commit your ways to the Lord, trust he shall bring it to pass. Anything in our life, no matter how good or how bad it is, it's the same, same decision, right? Commit it to the Lord. There is no other decision, right? We should not fear because he will take care of it. And the secret of it all is what happens next in this story, right? So God tells Elijah, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. So he goes out, right? And first there's this huge wind, right? And it says that the wind is so strong, it's tearing the mountain, like the rocks in the mountain apart, right? Just breaking it into pieces, right? Then second, there's this huge earthquake, right? Imagine the whole thing shaking. And then third, there's a huge fire, Right? So you can imagine like, the experience that Elijah is going through, all of this greatness, right? and everything, just, just the earth around him. But it says God was not in any of those things. And I will tell you that the, wired, the way that we're wired, that's where we want to see God. We want to see God in something big. We want to be, be able to see him. We want to be able to feel him. Like That's our expectation. We say, God, that's, that's how I want. That's what I want, right? But God says God was not in those things. He says, then there was a still small voice. Still small voice. I love this idea of the still small voice for so many different reasons, right? First, why, why still small voice? I heard one, um, one of the fathers said that it's because you have to be tuned into it, right? You can miss a still small voice, right? If you're not paying attention, 
you're gonna miss that still small voice. Another commentor, uh, commentary basically said, why is still small voice? Because he's close. Because he's close. And because he's close, all he needs to do is whisper. If he was far, he would need to yell. But he's close. And I love it because after this happens, right, Elijah, not, I'm sure not even be able to take in everything that's kind of going around, right? Elijah just repeats the same answer. He says, I love the Lord and I'm zealous. And the children of Israel are wicked and have forsaken your commandment. They have torn down the, the altars. I'm alone and I'm afraid. But I love that because God, again, meets him exactly where he is. And he gives him a very specific uh, instruction, right? He says, go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king of Syria. You'll, uh, you shall also anoint Jehru, the son of Nishmi, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, of Abdul Meloha, um, <laughs> he's a lot of names, you shall anoint as a prophet in your place. And it shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehru will kill. And whoever escapes the, the sword of Jehru, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not, bowed to, uh, have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth has not kissed him. So even, even when we see everything that God has done, all the different ways that show up, right? And then the, uh, Elijah, Elijah still being scared, still showing up, still wondering, God, I'm scared, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. You know, God, in all of his patience, just reassures him, right? He basically says, you don't have anything to worry about, right? And there's one thing, and I love the intimacy between Elijah and God's relationship here, because not only does he tell him, you know, hey, don't worry, I got, I got you. Like, I have a plan for all of this. He also told him the plan. Right? He told me exactly, like, this is going to happen, 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 right? And a lot of us, I will tell you, a lot of us, we might, on this side of eternity, the only things we might get is do not fear and you, and you are not alone. But I yearn that one day we enter into a relationship like Elijah here, well, God will share the secrets with us, right? Because there are people that I know in my life, right, that God shares the secrets with. And that's what we need to be praying for, and that's what we need to be moving towards. So today, I feel like God is telling us all kind of the same thing, right? So why should you be scared? Why should you be scared? All that stuff that we're carrying around with us, all the stuff that we have on our mind, like, you shouldn't be scared because I'm greater than all of those things. The same God who was faithful in the last however many years of your life, don't you think that he could be faithful again? Don't you think he will continue being faithful? Or do you think the past is where he, he closed the book? Right? And I feel like God's telling us, like, don't fear the unknown. Don't fear the unknown because even if it's unknown, it's not unknown to him. Even though we haven't seen it, he's already walked it. So he knows all of that things. And I felt like the message for today is that, guys, we cannot waver. That we have to know that God is always faithful. Amen? Questions, comments, concerns? Critiques? Anybody? Okay, only if it's constructive. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of one God, amen. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, because that's such a beautiful reminder, Lord, of all of your faithfulness. And Lord, your faithfulness is never ending. It never runs out. It's not limited. We can't. Just, it's just bottomless, Lord. I, I don't even know what to say about that. But Lord, I ask that you just allow us to remember that because I know that so many times, just like the great prophet Elijah, Lord, that he forgot, Lord, or his emotions got the best of us, got the best of him, Lord, the same way that my emotions get the best of me. But Lord, I ask that you keep that biblical truth just front and center, Lord, that you, even if we are faithless, that you are faithful and that you will continue to work for your name's sake, Lord. So Lord, I ask that the same way you met Elijah where he was, Lord, I ask that you meet us where we are as well. I ask you to give us a heart to pursue you the same way that Elijah had, that we can come and we can be vulnerable for you, Lord, and just kind of pour out how we're feeling so that you can meet us there. In the same way that you met Elijah, Lord, I ask that you meet us just as clearly. I ask that you have mercy on us, Lord, that you forgive us our sins, Lord, that you strengthen us, that you hear these prayers lifted in the sessions of your Holy Virgin Mother, Thetoko, Saint Mary, 
All your saints and martyrs, his we pray one voice, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, who has the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.